that's kind of one of the key things of what we're building is uh, ceramic domes that are 100% non-toxic. So there's no there's no wood, there's no metal, there's no concrete, there's no petrochemicals. The frame is ceramic, the exterior is ceramic, and the interior is ceramic, and it's filled with a, a healthy insulation material that could be wool or a cellular ceramic. Is there a solution to the housing crisis, our environmental crisis, and perhaps even our cultural crisis all in one? Way too many people can't afford homes right now, especially young people in the homes that we do build are generally affordable for the environment. The isolated wood boxes that we put ourselves in don't tend to bring us closer together either. Geoship might be fixing that. They're building sustainable bioceramic domes that are non-toxic, have a near zero carbon footprint, and are designed to last 500 years. They're also intended to be affordable and mass producible, and maybe even deployed in communities where people can live together, not apart. Sounds idealistic, maybe even unrealistic? Well, possibly, but the company has completed its first full-size prototype, has 400 orders, and is looking to enter full-scale production soon. To learn more, we're chatting with CEO and co-founder Morgan Beershank. Welcome to Tech First, Morgan. Hey, John. Thank you. Super pumped to have you. You're here for the second time. For those who didn't see the first one, talk about Geoship. What's the vision here? Yeah, the vision is um, mass manufacturing of affordable and regenerative homes and villages. So we're using a new material science to precast ceramic geodesic domes in two or three different sizes that interconnect with one another for a lot of different kind of living environments. So it's dome living, which is cool. You mentioned ceramic. Talk a little bit more about that. Most people think of ceramic, they think of, I don't know, a teacup, <laughs> you know, maybe yeah. tiles on a space shuttle or something like that. Why ceramic? How are you building it? And how does it last 500 years? Yeah, so it's a chemically bonded ceramic, so it doesn't require a high heat like you think of ceramics normally requiring. Um, it's really a, a new family of materials uh, kind of related to geopolymers. Uh, if people are familiar with what those are, but Essentially, you've got, you know, kind of ceramic cements and epoxies, and this material fits in the middle of all of them, and that it's like a ceramic, and then it's highly crystalline, covalent and ionic bonding, but like a cement, and then it's water activated, and like a epoxy or polymer, and that it forms molecular bonds with itself and with all kinds of aggregates, like uh, agricultural waste, and of course, like fly ash. Uh, we don't use fly ash because need more testing as to understand whether it leaches and the toxicity of black ash. That's kind of one of the key things of what we're building is uh, ceramic domes that are 100% non-toxic. So there's no, there's no wood, there's no metal, there's no concrete, there's no petrochemicals. The frame is ceramic, the exterior is ceramic, and the interior is ceramic, and it's filled with a, a healthy insulation material that could be wool or a cellular ceramic. Talk about what that gives you in a dome that you're living in. Is that comfortable? Is that super insulated? Uh, how, how's, it, how's it so long lasting? The dome shape like that, built with ceramics, uh, the way that we're doing it, you have a very big insulation cavity. Like this prototype that we installed has about a 10-inch thick insulation cavity. So that's wow. a high R value. And then also the ceramics reflect about 80% of radiant heat. So it's effective, uh, you know, insulative effects that way. And then also the dome shape just reduces the surface area <clears throat> by about 30 to 50% compared to a rectangular structure just because of reduced walls and roof or heat to escape. Because it's all ceramic, there's nothing to corrode or rot or burn. Um, and it can be repaired and resurfaced with the same ceramic material. Uh, so that really adds up to potentially very, you know, 500 year kind of design life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your vision isn't just that you sell one of these for a typical suburban lot, although I assume that that will happen. Um, but your vision is also to create communities, correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, the reason we're, we're doing this you know, in the first place is, is, has a lot to do with village building, right? So there's so many of us out there today, like myself included, that are, you know, have been uh, kind of looking for your village, 
you know, looking for your tribe of people that you want to build community with and really like, uh, connect with the land and have a place where your kids have many aunts and uncles around and a village to kind of welcome them home for, you know, many generations into the future. So it's kind of, you know, it's definitely a post climate change utopian future. And it feels like now is the time where we're, it's, there is going to be that post climate change future. And, you know, whether it's dystopian or utopian really depends on uh, what we focus on now. So talk about the size of the dome and how you accommodate if somebody has a larger family or more people that want to live in the same structure. What do you do? Do you have bigger domes? Do you add domes? What's it look like? Yeah. Um, so the smaller dome that we're building is about uh, an 18 foot. Now we, it was 16 foot previously. We kind of expanded it a little bit uh, in the prototyping process. It's about 18 foot uh, interior diameter and 20 foot exterior diameter. So that gives you about 250 square feet. So it's like a big bedroom basically. Or, and it, you can also fit a, a half loft in that. So you get up to maybe 400 square feet in a small dome. And then the bigger dome will be about, um, we haven't, which we haven't built yet. We'll probably install, you know, a few hundred of the smaller domes before we even uh, start producing the bigger dome. But the bigger dome will be about a 30 foot exterior diameter, 28 foot interior, which gives you about, um, so my math is right, about 700 square feet on the bottom floor and another 300 square feet on the top floor. So when you have those two building blocks, I mean, if you connect two big domes, you're at about 2000 square feet. If you connect a big dome with two small domes, you know, it's like over 1500 square feet or so. So there's, and that's the key is that there, you can have one big dome that has up to five, uh, small domes connected to it or, you know, all these constellations of. Which is pretty interesting, actually. You could have really interesting possibilities to have like a living room, a great room, a kitchen or something like that, a communal area. And then, you know, a couple bedrooms, maybe a library, maybe an entertainment room or something like that. Um, pretty interesting. Now, you mentioned that you built the smaller prototype, and that's actually why we're talking, because we talked about a year ago, you had the vision, you were working through the material science and all the other components and pieces and location and all that stuff. Now you've actually built one. Talk about that process. We're kind of innovating at like three different levels at one time, which is a little unusual, and that we're developing a material science and a product design and the manufacturing technology kind of all at once and pretty much look at almost anything else out there like a couple of those variables are set so we have like tons of uh, freedom <laughs> which also means tons of testing that's required to figure out you know which path is the right one so you know that's really um this dome that we installed it was really the goal is not was not to uh build the product that's going to go in your backyard the goal was to uh, get into like a phase of like hyper learning, right? So experimenting as much as we can to kind of uh, learn more about the whole technology, uh, manufacturing technology and the product design and the material science. So. Yeah, and there's so much to learn, as you're saying. I mean, not just manufacturing, but how to assemble it, how to put it together, how to ship it, all those other things that in the traditional world of home building, are solved, right? People know, okay, there's sticks, <laughs> two by fours, right? There's sheetrock, drywall. We ship that flat packet. There we go, right? You know, other things, roof material. There you go. And all this stuff comes in packages and all of it gets shipped. And you've got to figure all of that out because you've got non standard product and non standard sizing and a non standard assembly method, correct? Uh, yeah, non standard, but potentially much, much easier um in that you know so our goal is we're setting up um micro factories that can be really highly automated because it's just ceramic components you're just making you know a set of ceramic components that are flat packed and shipped to the site and designed in a way that uh, is supposed to help owner builders do the installation i mean there can be you know there will be a uh, geoship you know certified installers but it's really the potential for owner builders to do the installation, which, you know, an interesting comparison uh, is like last year in the U.S., there were 500 billion concrete blocks made. 500 billion. It's a huge number, <laughs> you know? 
and it's like those concrete blocks, each one is roughly the same uh, weight and <clears throat> and volume of a ceramic geodesic component. You know, you can imagine if we put the kind of innovation that has gone into concrete block making for the hundred last hundred years into ceramic dome making, we could 500 billion concrete blocks would be like a billion homes in one year produced. If we, if we can get to that, it, it's like the scalability is, is kind of at another level of what we think is what's possible today with building technologies. So well, you said a couple of things in there that are potentially game changing. Um, one is the owner build, and I want to get to that in a moment. Um, the, uh, the, the first is micro factories. Uh, I mean, our traditional means of manufacturing things is build the factory bigger, make it bigger, automate more, right? Uh, make um, a giant factory, pump more through it in high volume and make it cheaper. How will micro factories work and why are you going in that direction? Yeah, so the micro factory automation is really um, coming out strongly from the EV transition now. And, you know, a traditional factory is like more like an assembly line, <clears throat> whereas a micro factory has many um, kind of cells that produce different components and can be kind of reconfigured quickly. So uh, highly automated micro cells, and there might be many cells in a micro factory. So it, it, our, our goal is really like community owned micro factories. That's really interesting. And it's really actually kind of a neat trend as well, is that you produce stuff near to where it gets used. You don't spend a lot of money traveling, you know, transporting it over oceans and over <clears throat> land and everything like that. So you can bring the materials and to where the people are easily and quickly and fairly inexpensively. Now, you also mentioned the owner build, and that's I mean, the tradition you're kind of coming into as Geoship is this eco build, which um, has a long history of people building their own homes, whether that's with tires, whether that's with bottles, whether that's a rammed earth home or something like that, thatched home, um, straw bale home, those sorts of things. And there's something really appealing about that, right? I mean, I want to design my own home. I want to build my own home and I, I feel ownership. Talk about that trend and, and why you want to be part of that. Um, so a couple of reasons. One, uh, because it does give you that feeling of just like not only you building it, but your village building it together. I mean, it's such a community building act of just coming together to uh, build a home together. And the home building process with bioceramic domes is closer to like, assembling a piece of Ikea furniture or something. I mean, you just have a bunch of pre-made parts that only go together one way and there's no cutting and measuring and any of that. And, you know, if you look at kind of the history of the geodesic dome in the modern, you know, uh, century, it's been, it comes from this place of like back to the land movement, uh, people wanting to build their own homes and the geodesic just fits that well because of the, the way that it's constructed, it's just like a beautiful experience to put the thing together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the other side of that is like, okay, so if we could actually scale to, you know, where the concrete block industry is 500 billion block geodesic components a year in a billion homes, there'd be no one to install them if they needed specialized crews, right? So designing something for the owner builder is also like designing something for the the generalist in a sense that can that can support that. Right, right. Talk about cost. Um, that's one of the aspects that you're trying to address, and it's something that's really really important. Not only is there an epidemic of homelessness in North America, frankly, and probably globally as well. There's also a huge cohort of young people in their late teens to early 30s who are looking at housing markets that have just absolutely jumped skyrocketed in price over the the past couple of years especially but even for 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 a decade or more behind that and they're and they're thinking i can't possibly get into that market i will never own a home 
And there's some despair over that. There's some real despair over that. Talk about cost, what you're able to achieve right now and what your goals are. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's a good time to clarify that what we can achieve right now is we haven't set up a factory yet. So that's kind of the next phase that we're uh, fundraising for now is to set up the factory. And when the factory, when the factory first turns on, um, the base price of a bigger dome will be about a hundred thousand and the base price of a small dome will be about 30,000. Um, once you do the installation and the interior finishings, you're at like maybe about 15 percent, you know, maybe a hundred and sixty dollars a square foot kind of range. Um, but once it, it's like Tesla starting out with the Roadster, right? Like as the manufacturing scales, there's the potential for that price to go way down, like to a third, uh, just because it's we're literally getting raw minerals from a commodities market and creating components that are so it's bypassing all kinds of supply chains that are currently uh, relied upon in the building industry. So it's definitely the potential for just radically more affordable housing through this um, factory tech manufacturing. Interesting. And that brings to mind a question, what about site preparation? Um, do I need a traditional foundation? Um, do I have to have that poured? What What's that look like? Yeah, uh, we're designing the domes to fit on a, a few different foundations from like a, a stem wall to a, um, a slab foundation to uh, like a helical pier or elevated platform kind of foundation. So, you know, basically the same kind of foundations that you'd use today. This prototype that we just installed was, uh, it's a set of um, foundation blocks that are also ceramic that create a you know, sort of a stem wall type foundation. It's a little lower. Interesting. It's not a big concrete pour. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw on your website, you've sold, pre-sold 400 orders. Um, talk about uh, A, the process of ordering and B, what you're going to be doing to fulfill those and, and enter uh, a phase of mass production. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we haven't, uh, since that, Camp, since we raised capital, pretty much like 98% of that has gone into design and engineering, not marketing, not creating hype. Uh, so, you know, yeah, there's, a, there's about 500 pre-orders at this point. Um, we closed the pre-order window uh, a few weeks ago and we'll be opening it up again uh, relatively soon. And the process is, is kind of similar to like uh, how Again, Tesla is doing like pre-orders. It's like a $99 refundable pre-order and it just kind of reserves your spot in line. And then when we get closer to our manufacturing window, um, people will be able to turn the pre-orders into orders uh, and configure their domes. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to press you a little bit on that. What do you think the timeline is around that? Yeah, so... Um, we're we're aiming to be in pilot production, uh, so we're re taking everything we learned from this first prototype install and just like designing uh, for your backyard, basically. Yeah. Uh, and then go into kind of a pilot production phase uh, in about 12, 12 months. That is, you know, a few domes a month or one to three domes a month. That is just to get the product out there and get people to experience it and uh, and see how it does in the field. And then we're about um, three years, let's say two, two to four years. It's a little hard to predict at this stage. Like companies often make really optimistic projections. And then it's like you go into kind of a manufacturing hell in a sense, like it's just learning <laughs> so much as you go. So I, I hate to put too much timeline out there, but about two to four year time horizon until we're in like a more volume production. Yeah, production hell brings to mind uh, the company that you've mentioned a couple of times, Tesla, um, and some of the predictions <laughs> have come out of that company, and particularly the founder of that company. Where's my self-driving taxi? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that is uh, interesting, and, and that is cool. It is out there. It is a ways out there, but at least you're not promising, hey, in six months, in 18 months or something like that, and then and then failing to deliver on that. I'm guessing while you're going through this era of designing for manufacturability, 
you know, this where you're going to get to one to three domes a month, that sort of thing. You're also kind of designing the micro factory. Am I right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's just a natural step in developing the micro factory automation technology. So let's say you get the micro factory correct. Um, what's the manufacturing capacity in your thinking right now of one micro factory? Um, one micro factory we're thinking now is on the scale of like a hundred to 200,000 square feet. Uh, and it's producing maybe 300 domes a month uh, of the smaller dome. So the bigger dome would be more like if it's 300 small domes, it's like a hundred or 150 bigger domes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like, like I said, just the beginning because it's just Casting these ceramic components in factories and stacking them onto pallets for shipping can be extremely efficient. One of the things with the ceramic is just, it's like got a flash cure, right? So it's like from the time that the material hits the mold, uh, you can demold in anywhere from like 30 minutes at the high or maybe 45 minutes at the high end if we need to stretch it, but at the low end, like three minutes. So it can be really efficient mass production kind of process. Wow. Interesting. And I just realized that micro factory means different things, to different people, a hundred thousand to 200,000 feet doesn't sound that micro, but I'm guessing on when you're talking actual factories, which I'm not in that world, that is small. Uh, and then I guess what your, what your plan will be is, Hey, you can get one of these micro factories up and running. You can dot them around the world now, correct? Yeah. And I should clarify that, you know, a hundred thousand square foot micro factory would probably have uh, 10 to 20 cells production cells within it, right? So there's a potential to take a cell and just have it you know, five or 10,000 square foot factory, but just you do the math and like what were, how far they'd need to be spaced and whatnot to make any sort of dent in the housing market, then, you know, 100 to 200,000 square feet is like a, a micro factory outside of most um, major cities. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. you know, gets us like some dent in the uh, housing industry. Sounds good. Talk a little bit about the ownership model. Um, you are seeking investors. It is uh, not a traditional corporation, though, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what would the ownership model be and how, let's say somebody catches this vision and says, you know what, I want a microfactory in Romania. I want a microfactory in Argentina or something like that. Can they do something like that? Can you do something like that? What's, what's, how's that work? Yeah, well, we felt it was really important to the geoship starts as like a grassroots project. So instead of uh, getting venture capitalists on board, we went through equity crowdfunding and made it so that people could invest like 300, a minimum of like, I think $380. So we have thousands of investors from our first round and we're doing another fundraise now to raise more capital, thousands more investors. Uh, and it is, geoship is a, a it's pretty much a C Corp standard corporation. It's actually technically a social purpose corporation. So it's like a C Corp with a purpose written into the charter. But our goal is to transition into a multi-stakeholder cooperative. So it's basically like a, a decentralized to some extent in that um, the, the kind of conventional stakeholder groups are like employees and investors own companies. Um, we're ex expanding that to customers have ownership and nature has ownership. So to four stakeholder groups that come into co-ownership and co-governance. And then the, the uh, growth strategy around like a micro factory in a Peru or whatever is uh, we work with a local community, local founders to uh, set up a factory and it's like co-owned between the local community and GH, it's kind of a franchise model, but more with this multi-stakeholder cooperative um, uh, addition to it. Or... I almost smell blockchain there, but um, of course that's not necessary for exactly what you're doing. It's pretty, pretty much like the multi-stakeholder cooperative is pretty much the analog version of a DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Very good. Okay, so you've given a timeline of two to four years when you'll be in production. Is that basically the timeline when somebody can, you know, go into your website, click buy now, order it and get it shipped in a month or a week or something like that? Well, so I, I mentioned we have 500 pre-orders, like with almost very little marketing. So I, you know, uh, 
if people want to dome in, in any kind of near future, you should go and pre-order now because it basically reserves your spot in line. Like in, when we start manufacturing in four years, we'll probably have tens of thousands of pre-orders and it'll take us a few years to just catch up with the pre-orders that come in. So mm-hmm. get on the mm-hmm. pre-order mm-hmm. list now for <laughs> five years. Okay. Interesting. Good stuff, Morgan. Thanks so much for taking this time. Do appreciate it. Uh, hope that um, uh, somewhat easier times are ahead. I know you had all the challenges figuring out how to make it work and the material science and all that stuff. Um, and uh, I guess, you know what? It doesn't get any easier. I'm sorry. I'm going to pop that bubble right now just by myself. <laughs> figuring out manufacturability and scaling is one of the harder challenges in business, correct? Yeah. But, you know, with, uh, it's about hiring really, really smart people. <laughs> so, you know, it, at least the challenge gets distributed. When you first start a company, it's like all the challenges are, are with you. And then yes, it's not easier, but more distributed. That's thanks, Paul. <laughs> Very good. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks so much, John. <laughs>